Good morning and God bless you. Thank you for your prayers. Um, yeah, before I start, I just need to take a couple of minutes just to give God some praise because you know what? The devil's a liar. He is working hand and foot today so that our service, our, our Sunday school would not go forward. I left my house at about 20 past eight to make it to church to, to teach from church. Um, and um, I didn't even make it 10 minutes and my brand new car breaks down again in the middle of the road. I'm stuck, can't go anywhere. I called the roadside assistance and um, Mercedes are very uh, excellent company. They're on top of things. But I was I waited and waited and waited. Nobody's um, keep getting the message. Somebody will be with you in a minute for 15 minutes. And I, I managed to get the car to start. So I chugged along a little bit further, trying to get back home. Then again, I had to pull over. Anyway, I finally got roadside assistance, um, had to wait for the guy to come. I said to him, well, it's driving. You think you can follow me home and then I'll just, you can sort it. He said, he, he ran his diagnostic and said, I don't think you should drive the car. So he got me a taxi home and he's taking care of the car. So I'm, I walked in this house two minutes ago and here I am. But you know what? It's because today we're talking about religious leaders and the religious spirit. And the devil knows we're about to expose some stuff. So he's tried, this today wasn't the only day. So much has happened throughout the week. Um, and as you just heard Jonathan say, just to get him, you know, get everything up and running. So I know that whatever's going to be delivered today um, is exposing something that the devil does not want to be exposed. He wants us to stay where we are and continue in the realm that we're in. And that way he's cool because we're not bothering what he's doing. But when we expose him and when we expose what he does and we enlighten ourselves and do something about it, then we're a threat to the kingdom of darkness. So today, open, get a pen and a paper, open our minds and be true to yourself today. Be true to yourself. We often read the Bible and we say that was then and we say, oh, wow, yes, but we don't apply it to us today. And everything in the Bible is relevant today for every generation, for every culture, wherever you are in the world, when you pick up the word of God, it can relate to you it's relevant so today we're going to we're going to turn the kingdom of darkness upside down yes so we've got one hour to dig in and i know it's not going to be able there's no way we're going to cover it there's so much in this lesson today we're not going to be able to, to to cover it i wish i had a series to do this but today we're going to do our best to at least um get the tip of the iceberg and um, I, I pray that we'll all engage and be blessed <clears throat> today. So Jesus confronts the religious leaders. <clears throat> so we're in Mark chapter two. And there's three um, areas here where the lesson shows how Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, confronts these leaders. So the first one is about healing and forgiveness. The second one is eating and fasting. And the third is the Sabbath. So on these three, um, in these three um, areas, you see how Jesus has to confront the leaders regarding these things and their religious attitude. Yeah. So he, 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 he confronts legalism, but he uses his authority. Yeah. And legalism um, is something that is so easy um, to do that it becomes a part of what we do. And we don't even realize it, we're becoming legalistic. <clears throat> and it's it's a it's the way that spirit actually um, operates, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. So our central truth then <clears throat> is that Jesus confronts the errors of the legalism and authority with authority. The focus is that we consider why Jesus confronted the leaders and to avoid legalism. And then the evangelism emphasis is <clears throat> that Jesus not only heals but he also forgives, yeah. Our, our central truth um, or our golden text is the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. <clears throat> so let's go to the next slide, please. So today we're going to explore those, those three instances that we just talked about. We're going to see how Jesus actually confronted these religious leaders and um, 
these religious leaders, they embrace religion and not relationship. Yeah, that's what that's what they um, their key thing was that they 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 had more emphasis on uh, the religious aspect of things and not the relationship with the master himself. We today have religious spirit. It's rife. R I F E in capital letters. It's rife. It's rife in in Christendom. It's rife across our churches. It's re, it's re, it's rife. And we need to we need to dig into this today and see um, what the Lord is doing to help us to combat this, to recognize it, and to address it as Jesus did with authority when it does um, appear its ugly head. So the first instance, and I'm going to try and go through each one um, of these instances, and then we'll just talk about um, the religious spirit, so to speak, in in a more specifically. Um, hopefully time will allow us to get there. So <clears throat> the next slide then, we're going to talk about the healing and forgiveness. So um, <clears throat> I don't even see, let me see who's on. If you could, if I can find someone for me to read. Um, <clears throat> Christine and Sister Coleman are my favourite readers. Don't be mad at everybody else. But if Sister Christine, if you're on, I can't, um, just, would you just read for me Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Sorry, I was just having trouble on muting. Mark 2 oh, verses. Thank you. Good morning. Morning. Mark mm. 2. Yeah, Mark 2. 1 to 5. Oh, 1 to 5. Okay. <clears throat> and again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, Many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. It's verse five. Thank you. Bless you. Um, so this, this account then um, is about, again, Jesus uh, taking care of this, this man is brought to Jesus. Now, um, as, as Christine just read, the, the story goes that the, 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 everybody's heard about Jesus, yeah? Everybody knew, um, or heard about all the things that was going on where he was concerned. And he came home, he actually came home for a rest. Um, but because they knew that he was in town, everybody came. And there were so many people that the room was filled where he was, people, the crowd was pressed everywhere. So hearing about how Jesus um, was healing um, the sick, um, these four men brought um, their friend to be healed of Jesus. But because the crowd was so thick, they were unable to get to him. Um, and Lord help me not to preach this morning because you know, sometimes we've got people that wanna get to God and they can't, but they just need some friends. Um, but anyway, that's for another time. So um, you just need someone to help you get to Jesus. So anyway, these four men, they didn't just say, well, look, the crowd is too thick. There's no way we're gonna get in there. The man's on the bed, you can't, we can't get him in. The, the Bible says that they, they uncovered the roof. And Morgan says that such a rendering is entirely misleading. The force of the word is that they broke up the roof of the house, tearing up the fabric in order to lower the man down on his pallet into the presence of Jesus. So it wasn't just like they, they you know, they had to tear up the roof to, in order to get the man down. What, what tenacity, what... Um, what conviction they had to say, we need to get this man to Jesus. We have family members. We have family members. We have friends that are, that are dying in sin. And we, how much effort are we making to bring them to Jesus, to bring them to his presence? 
but that's not what the lesson's about today. But just put that one, write that one down on your piece of paper. Um, so they 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 went through um, they went through more than just you know uncovering the roof. They tore it up in order to get him in Jesus' presence. So when they had broken through, they let the paralytic man down. But it's interesting here what Jesus said. Now, of course, we see their determination to get the man there in front of Jesus. The fact that they lowered him from the roof down in front of Jesus, they must have had the expectation that the man was going to walk out of there because if they lowered him down on the bed, how are they going to get him out? <laughs> they couldn't raise him back up through the roof. They obviously were convinced in their hearts that that man would walk out of there. What faith, what faith did they have, you know, to think that putting him down is all they had to do and Jesus will take care of the rest. Wow, that, that moves me to say, where is my faith? How much faith do I have um, in putting things in front, into Jesus, in front of Jesus in his presence and leaving him to do what he does? So we see here that they had great faith um, to, 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 to go this far, to tear up the roof, lower the man down, knowing that the man um, in their heart would actually walk out of that building. So in this account, the emphasis is on the faith of the friends as well. Now, some people would say that Jesus says um, he saw their faith. I don't believe it was just the faith of the ones putting him down. Um, I think the faith of the man also, because he had to be part and parcel of the whole thing. If he didn't have, didn't have the faith, I don't think it would have happened. But Jesus saw their faith. I think he's, he's um, talking about all of them, the, the men that laid him, lowered him down, and also the man himself. But the, 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 it, was, it was the faith that Jesus saw that was able to meet the needs of others whom we bring to him is, is the point I just made. So he saw their faith, seeing how all that they did to get the man to him, yeah? But in the midst of um, this uh, account, we also have um, these Pharisees. So Jesus answered, before I go there, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, yeah? So he saw all of their faith, but he spoke to the man, the man who was in the need. He said to him, to the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, don't you think that's a bit weird? Don't you think that's like, well, he's there, he's a paralytic. And um, that word paralytic could mean that he was um, paralyzed from his neck down. He, he couldn't do anything for himself. He was completely useless, yeah, this man. So this man is on the bed and he says, your, your sins are forgiven you. Anybody got any comments on that? Any comments on, on, on that? Jesus said, did the man go there for his sins to be forgiven? They lowered him down for, them, for God, Jesus, to heal him. And he looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. Maybe he had done something, perhaps, I don't know, or thought something that was not right. And he knew it himself and he felt that God might not heal him because of his thoughts, bad thoughts. Okay. Well, maybe he came, maybe he came to Jesus. So, you know, when, when we have, we have altar call and we ask if anybody wants to give their heart to the Lord, maybe that's, that was part of him coming there, not only to be healed, but to actually accept Christ as his savior, because what isn't that the, that we do the sinner's prayer. Um, if you want this, the Lord to come into your heart, you, re you recite the, the, the prayer that allows yourself to be wholly taken over by God and for God to come into your life. Okay. Pastor Leo. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Good, morning. Um, good to see you. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking about that as well. Um, I love what's been said about um, coming to the Lord and how he sees us and he's able to forgive our sins. Um, as Samuel the prophet said that, um, uh, well, it was Nathan actually said that man looks at the outward appearance, mm -hmm. but God looks at the heart, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And Jesus is able to see the source of all of our needs. Uh, even though he had this physical condition, which was 
um, of great concern and which was the main cause for which he came to Jesus. Jesus looked beyond that and could see the real need was for his sins to be forgiven. And in doing so, it would be a holistic healing that would be accomplished, not just the physical, but also the inner man would be healed too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we know Pastor Lil, good today. morning. Oh yeah, go ahead, good morning. Um, just to add to what has been said, the thought that came to me is that when God looks at us, the, the, the state of our heart makes us more sick than any physical sickness that we have. Um, so his friends saw that he was paralyzed and helpless and would stop at nothing to get him before Jesus. But when Jesus saw him, he saw that there was even more wrong with him than his physical um, sickness. And, and I think that is how he sees us as well, um, which is why even though we may bear infirmities in our bodies, if our heart is, if our sins are already forgiven, if our heart is right, he sees us in a whole state, so to speak. Thank you. Sister Irish, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, in, in addition to what all has been said is when he saw the fate of the person, prayer is already being granted because of the fate that he see in the person. Okay, right, he saw his face. So yeah, every, every comment, fantastic, absolutely. Um, Jesus, um, and as Candy so eloquently put it, he saw that the, 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 the fact that the man sinned, uh, that was more of a sickness than his actual infirmity that he was bearing. The fact that he was a sinner um, and needed to be saved, that in itself um, trumped his physical um, healing. So Jesus is, was more concerned about forgiving his sins rather than healing the disease, even though that he's able to do both. But Jesus, this was because Jesus knew that sin is the fundamental problem of humankind. Sin is the fundamental problem, and that's why he came to sort that out. Now, the healing of the body um, is almost like a fringe benefit, if you like, to Jesus's ministry, but his core ministry was to save the souls of men. So seeing his sin, seeing that he needed to be forgiven of his sin was, um, was um, his fundamental um, purpose. Now, um, I, I wrote down this quote that I found or this statement um, during study and it says, in Jesus Christ, we see God manifest in the flesh, yeah? We see God in the flesh when we see Jesus. And in the problems and the visible infirmities of men, we see sin manifest in the flesh. So just like we see God in the flesh when we look at Jesus. When you look at mankind, you see sin in the flesh. So our sicknesses, we were, um, Adam and, and Eve never had any infirmities. They never had any illnesses or, or anything wrong. They were perfect human beings, but it was sin that caused those things to happen. Yeah, so sin is the fundamental problem. Next slide for me, please. So Chris, being is your, I'm going to have you be my scribe today. If you then would just read verse six and seven for me, please. Actually, it's right there on the screen if you want to. Just read it from there. Sorry, was that me again? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to, I'm not going to have you as my designated scribe. <laughs> and some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. So now here we, here we have this, here we see these scribes now, yeah? They were um, so concerned um, with Jesus' statement here um, that they, they, they didn't see anything else. From as soon as Jesus said, your sins be forgiven you, um, they they it, it perked up their ears now were they wrong to think that in any way were they wrong to think that somebody can say 
your sins be forgiven you. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Isn't that right? You can talk to me. I won't bite. Pastor, yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, just just on that question, because I, I always like to, as you said at the beginning, it's, it's applied to our lives, but also think about how they were living when Jesus was around. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we, we we teach and we know that in the Old Testament, um, the high priest and the animal sacrifice was the way to kind of get sins atoned. Um, so as much as Jesus was around, a lot of people just didn't get who Jesus was. It was a new concept, you know. So, you know, I'd like to think um, if I was there hearing somebody speaking about forgiveness of sins, when you very know you have to go to the tabernacle or the, uh, you know, the temple to, to, to seek sin. I don't know if I'm going to accept it straight away, you, you know. So there'll be that kind of question anyway although the prophets did prophesize, you know, Jesus was coming. So I think to kind of answer your question, um, got, now I've got the scriptures, I've got to, uh, you know, I can, I can think and behave differently towards the situation. But I think, you know, the questions that I read and how they behave doesn't surprise me on top of how the, um, the Pharisees, if you like, also behave because they knew the law, but were so structured and rigid in their minds, you know, they, they, they just couldn't comprehend as well so that that also caused um a reaction from them to say who is this man as well right Right. um what what for them to question how somebody could say um they your sins be forgiven you um who can forgive sins but god yes that would be blasphemy however the problem here is that the person that they're talking about is the person who can forgive sins and so Blasphemy was an offence that was punishable by death. And while Jesus had not specifically said he could forgive sins, he'd implied as much, yeah, by declaring, but with authority, that the man's sins were forgiven. In making this claim, he assumed a divine prerogative, something only God could assume. So they were wrong in their reasoning, but they were also correct. The problem is that they correctly believe that only God can forgive sins. I'll give them that. However, their error is in refusing to see who Jesus is and the God, the, God, the son who has the authority to forgive sins. So as much as they knew the law, they knew the prophecies, they knew all of that. They were not accepting Christ as the, the Messiah, as the son of God. And that's where they went wrong. The other thing um, is. Son, your sins are forgiven you. We can imagine also, if you look at the four friends, they were peering down through the roof, right? Watching to see what, how, how and when their friend was going to be healed. And when they hear Jesus saying to him, son, your sins be forgiven you, I can hear them saying, we never brought him here for no sins forgiven. We want to see the man walk. We want to see him walk. What, what's this forgiving of sins business? You know, he's, we're here to see, see our friends you know, be delivered from his, you know, from his bed, yeah? Um, so they, in their minds, they were thinking, what, what's he talking about, forgiving of sins? The Pharisees would, should have known better because they knew the word. So um, Jesus did not mean that because the paralyzed man was sinful, that's why he was paralyzed. And that's a point we have to really um, just stop and think about for a minute. A lot of to- uh, the the, he, the uh, Pharisees, um, especially felt that sins were connected with your health. Now we do know that certain things can make you, if you have unforgiveness, it can make you sick. You can be physically sick from, from sinful habits and behaviors. That's the truth. But if you have, if you're born blind, doesn't mean it's because your mother was a sinner while you were born blind. They felt like your sin was connected your your to your um to your health in that way so jesus wasn't saying this man is a cripple on the bed this way because he's a vile sinner um and of all the things that he's thought or done it wasn't related to that he wasn't saying that was the reason he was he wasn't um uh the parallel was directly caused by sin instead he was addressing the man's need so he was saying, I'm not saying that it's because you're, you're paralyzed because you're a sinner. I'm saying because you're a sinner, you need to be forgiven of those sins more than you even need 
to be healed of your paralysis. So he was addressing his knee. And the common root of all pain and suffering is sin. Yeah, it's that sinful condition. So the Pharisees, when they heard Jesus speak, what was in their hearts, they should have been enough to let them, when, when, from the time Jesus said, uh, why, is he, why, are you th- why are you thinking that in your heart? I'd have been like, how does he know what I'm thinking? <laughs> that would have made me think this man is more than just any old teacher. Yeah, because Jesus said to Jesus um, addressed them um, directly, you know, the, the, the Pharisees, just from him saying that would have made me think this is no ordinary man. He already knows what I'm thinking, you know, before I've even said it. So the Pharisees, as they mumbled between amongst, amongst themselves and in their hearts about what Jesus had done. Uh, give me slide five, please. Jesus, and I'll just read this um, real quick. Um, but that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed. Yeah. So Jesus answered them by saying, so that you'll know the Son of Man has the power to forgive sin. And then he says, take up your bed and walk. So again, it's like you're talking about sins and now you're telling him to stand and walk. Immediately he rose up, took his bed, went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God. We never saw anything like this in this fashion. I've never seen anything like this before. Jesus met the scribes on their own scholarly ground. He, 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 he came to them where they were. The rabbis had a saying, there is no sick man healed of his sickness until all his sins have been forgiven him. That's what the rabbis would teach, and that's what they believe. No man will be healed of his sickness until his sins were forgiven. So that means if you're sick, it's because you've been sinning. Yeah. So um, to the Jews, a sick man with whom God was angry, that's, that was what the rabbis believed. What, that's what they felt. So the, so the Pharisees, in their mind, unless this man is healed, is healed, is uh, forgiven of his sins, he cannot be healed. So now Jesus is saying, to it, knowing how they think, Jesus is saying, okay, then the scribes are ready to launch a public attack. However, Jesus, understanding their motives, he presented a challenge. Whether it's easy to say to the sick man, get up and walk, or your sins be forgiven you, which is easier? Arise and take your bed and walk? Or is it easier for me to say, your sins be forgiven you? Undoubtedly, the reason Jesus used this approach was because a sick man was seen as a sinful man. In effect, Jesus was saying, you declare that I have no right to forgive sins. You believe that if the man is sick, he is a sinner and he cannot be cured until he's forgiven. Jesus spoke the word and the man was healed. So now, according to your belief, the man couldn't be cured unless he was forgiven. So you're saying, how can you forgive sins? And you're, but you also say you have to have your sins forgiven before you can be healed. So once Jesus says to him, be healed and he's healed, then obviously Jesus has also forgiven his sins. You see where I'm going with this? The Pharisees then had nothing. They, there was no combat for them because they saw that if we go on the premise that only God can forgive sins and a, a sick man won't be healed until his sins are forgiven. The fact that Jesus healed him meant that somewhere in there his sins had to have been forgiven first. So here Jesus is coming to, with authority. He's coming to them at where they are. He's showing them that what you're saying is nonsense because here you say what you say, you're contradicting yourself as I am the, I'm the one that can forgive and also heal. So he was able then to um, come, at the, come at the Pharisees and show him both forgiveness of sins and healing of this poor man. So they were all in, uh, in awe and astonishment once the act had happened, because now what could they say? Somehow his sins had to have been forgiven for him to be also healed. And we thank God for that. Just a quick sidebar. Tell me how many gifts do we see Jesus um, displaying here? How many gifts of the spirit? Come on, my scholars who have been in our lessons. 
Unmute yourself and tell me some. There's at least three. Gift of healing, word of yeah. wisdom, mm -hmm. word of knowledge. Yep. Anything else? Discernment is in there as well, Pastor Leo. That's right. That's the one I was looking for, discernment. Thank you, um, all the, um, our wonderful panelists and teachers. Um, yes, yeah, you see that Jesus displayed all those gifts in this one instant, yeah? So we talk about the gifts of the Spirit and having one. You can display several all at one time. The fact that he um, gave a word of wisdom to them. Um, also, he discerned what the Pharisees were thinking. We see that he actually healed. Um, this man. Sister Margaret has her hand up. Sister Margaret? It was discernment, um, Pastor oh, Lou. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, wonderful. So here, that's the first instance we see. So you see how, um, how the Pharisees display this arrogance in in looking at Jesus and seeing what he's doing, yet still trying to pick out something that he's doing wrong, yeah? Again, it's that religious spirit. It's that spirit of um, who does he think he is, yeah? And, and, and trying, to, trying to undermine everything that he's doing. And this is the first instance we see this. The fact that the man was healed was, um, was almost not even... A, it wasn't even, it was, a, it was more the fact that Jesus was saying that his sins were forgiven bothered them more than the fact that, wow, he could heal this man of his sickness. And that's how religious they were. That as long as anything that made, made uh, you know, look like it didn't go along with the law as they saw it is where they, is what they wanted to, um, to, to unravel and show Jesus up and to make him look bad. Um, is, is or the motive, the motive, um, you know, the, the picture before when you see the Pharisees, they're so well groomed, you know, and they just look, you know, they look so pious and full of, of you know, the, you know, they've got their heads covered and their, their robes and they walk around with that same pious attitude. Um, yet still, they can't have the heart to be glad that someone's sins are forgiven or that they are healed of their infirmities. So let's move on swiftly to fast eating and fasting. Pastor Lil, just, yes, just as you're moving on, I was just reflecting on all that you've been saying there and just trying to um, uh, picture the situation uh, that was unfolding there and, and, I, and, and bring it right back to our day and how we can find ourselves in a similar trap. Mm -hmm. We can be very Pharisaic in the sense of our religiosity that we, we, we discount and discredit what others might be doing in the kingdom, Absolutely. in the kingdom ministry. And so we don't recognize, we can see things happening and because of our uh, embedded theology, if you like, because of our positioning, we think that they can't be real, they can't be doing that, that can't be happening because it's not happening from amongst our circle. So we discount it, we discredit it, just like the Pharisees and miss out on the greater ministry and acknowledgement of what God is able to do through whoever he chooses to use to perform his miracle and to perform his will. Amen. Amen. Very true. So again, then we see um, uh, slide six, um, the Jews um, here, Again, we know that fasting was um, part of the law. They had specific days in which they fasted. Um, and so, Chris, could you go ahead and read for me um, verse 15 and 16 of the same chapter? 15 and 16. Yes, please. Disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to the disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Yep. 
So, um, just to just to cap, so Levi is Matthew. So we know that often, um, the, you know, the Jews you would have two more than one name, two names picked commonly, and um, Jews would have two names. And uh, Matthew um, is Levi in this in this um, account. And so Matthew was a social outcast amongst the Jews. They saw him as both a sinner and one who mingled with sinners. Because he was a tax collector um, in the city of Capernaum, the Jews hated tax collectors, not just because um, of the fact that they took their money. They were often very dishonest. But the fact that they were Jew he, he was Jewish and working for the Romans, that hurt them even more, that you're going to work for the Romans and take our money, you know. So tax collectors were at the bottom of the pile. Um, um, because they worked for Rome, it, it, they were despised even more. They were seen as being the same as lepers, murderers, thieves, and it was um, even considered wrong. It was considered not wrong if you told them a lie. But if you lied to them, they wouldn't consider that being wrong because they were so below that you could lie to them and it would be okay. <laughs> so um, we see the context then of how Matthew and his com you know, comrades were looked upon. Then here we see that Jesus calls um, Matthew and then G and Matthew invites him back to come and hang out with them, yeah? And the Pharisees here now, they see that Jesus is there eating and drinking with these publicans and these tax collectors and these horrible people here yeah, that, that are the scum of the earth. And the scribe said to him, how, how is he eating and drinking with these publicans and sinners? What's he doing with these people? Yeah, that, that's, that's what was in their heart. They despised the tax collectors um, without even thinking they lumped them together with sinners. The accusers of Jesus in this passage considered a sinner to be anyone who did not agree with the detail um, of their, of what, of their uh, meticulous diligence. So if you weren't like them and didn't have, uh, you know, weren't so diligent about the law and all of that, then you were a sinner. And here's Jesus, who's supposed to be a rabbi teaching, you know, and preaching and doing all these things. And here he is with these sinners. And the thing is, um, he, he, he never, um, Jesus, as much as he mingled with the sinners, he never sacrificed his principles. He never, he never, he never, his behavior never, uh, you know, went below standard or changed in order to fit in with them. Um, Jesus kept his principles wherever he was and whoever, whichever company he was in. Paul encouraged us as believers to take opportunities to dine with unbelievers a means perhaps of reaching them for Christ. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever you, is put before you without raising question of conscience. That's 1 Corinthians 10, verse 27. That's the NIV version. So Paul encouraged people. We can be so religious that you say, mm, I'm not going there. They're drinking and smoking. I'm not going in there. You know, because we, we don't want to be seen amongst those people. You know, there's no... That some of you uh, wouldn't would be we wouldn't be uh, put foot in a pub. You wouldn't go anywhere that would be considered ungodly, yeah. Because for you that makes you look bad. But if you uh, your work friends meeting together for a meal at a pub and you go there, you're a light. You you need to be a more, how are you going to win them? The Bible says the gospel is hid. To them that are lost, how are we going to win folks if we don't want to be where they are? Jesus had Jesus went way where they were. Jesus mingled with the prostitutes and the sinners and the publicans in order for them to see him as Christ. They will never see us as Christ. We want to stay in our building, stay in our four walls, and bid them come. But we need to go where they are. We can't be so religious that we are too too high and too mighty and too clean uh, to be seen amongst sinners. We should be amongst the sinners, yeah? We should be amongst the sinners to the point where we influence them. Light in darkness is great because once the light gets there, the darkness will have to leave and that's what we have to be. Our response 
our response to sinners should be not one of judgment, but one of here is Christ, see him in me, yeah? And that's where the Pharisees um, for sure went wrong. How did Jesus then um, address this? Next slide, please. So when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, um, I, I need to come to call the right, sorry, those, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's fine to um, go to a racetrack and um, see people running. Um, you're not going to find, you're not going to heal anybody. They're all fit and well running their marathons and their races. They don't need you. You need to go to the hospital where the people have got the broken legs and the, uh, uh, you know, that need to be to be uh, fixed. That's where your your needs are. So we can't expect people to. We know when people come to our church or come to our location, or, yeah, our church. We know that at that point, there's there's um there, there are people that need healing and need to be delivered and and so forth. But the fact that they've come means that they've they're at a certain place. But the ones that don't even see to come, they're the ones that we need to reach. There's, there's again a quote from Morgan that says, I am constrained to say that I believe at this very hour, one of the secrets of arrest and one of the reasons for the condition of things in the Christian church that is troubling us in many ways is the, is the aloofness of the Christian church from sinning men and women. We still build our sanctuaries and set up our standards and institute our arrangements and say to the sinning ones, if you will come to us, we will help you. Mm. You've got it backwards. Mm -hmm. We can't build our sanctuaries and say, come to us and we'll help. No, we need to, call, we need to go to them. And Jesus is saying to the, the Pharisees, mm -hmm. don't be so religious that we should think that, yes, if you want, your, your sins forgiven and if you want to be um you know what you should be you need to come to us come to the tabernacle where we can set you right that's not how it's to be uh, we're, we're where we are in our church today but you know what somebody said that hip, the um atheists are the product of hypocrites it's because they see so many hypocrites in the church why they say they don't want to come to church and why they say they don't believe in god because they see the behaviors of those that profess to be Christian. We're hypocrites a lot of the time. Some of us all of the time, you know? You would pay your tithes every week, but you'd be the last one to give a, a homeless man a, a pound out of your pocket. We're hypocrites. It's not about, oh, I paid my tithes, so yeah, I've, done, I've ticked my box for the week. Think about outside of, of your Christian duty and what you're supposed to do and what you're required to do and where's your relationship with God? How, how does the Holy Spirit move on you to do those things? Now, what I really want to get, I'm sure there's probably some comments from that um, section, um, but I, I'd like, I really would like, we don't have a lot more, much more time left and I really want to, um, to tackle a few things at the end. So I, I'm trying to kind of get through all these three points. So if you would um, just bear with me, if we go, um, if we think about then after he addresses their thoughts about actually dining with them, the re their, their answer to him was the fact that um, we fast, yeah, we fast twice a week. Um, Jesus said to them, can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them. So he taught, they taught, they basically were saying, um, you're here having all these feasts and eating and drinking with all these sinners, um, yet still look, we're fasting. And, and they mentioned John the Baptist too, John the Baptist's disciples, they're fasting. So, you know, what, what, what's your disciples doing? What kind, of a, what kind of a thing are you running here? Yeah, and he's saying, look, the bridegroom's here, so there's no need for them to fast now. But there's going to be a time when they will fast. Fasting isn't about again checking that box or doing it just because now the fasting that they were talking about wasn't even required they did it they did it for to be seen of men yeah they were doing it so that they could say yep yeah, i'm fasting today to make them look like they were 
something that they really were not. So Jesus, Jesus attacked it or he addressed it because he wanted them to know that it's not about being ritualistic. Ritualism is rebuked here. Jesus was trying to show them that during the, his ministry, um, the customary observances had gradually usurped the vital re, um, religion with, with multitudes, meaning that it, it rose, the, the, the actual rituals that they were doing rose above the reason, it rose above the, the, the relationship, it rose up. Why do we sacrifice? Why, why do we do the Day of Atonement? Why do we fast? That the, the why had gone out the window. They just were doing the things that they had to do and saying, yep, I've done that, yep, I've done that. And that's all that the religion became. And that was not its intention. Freedom is, Jesus wanted to say, look, we're free to say, I'm not going to fast today. We're free to say, I'm fasting on Wednesday. We're free to do that. Why? Because it's not about the law. It's not about checking those boxes. Freedom in doing those things and doing them in the right way. My disciples are here not to fast because you're fasting, but they fast when they, when they feel in their heart to fast. <clears throat> and even though others might be fasting, that's not a reason to fast. So Jesus was trying to, to show here that there's a freedom in that. And as long as we allow religion to rule, we won't have freedom. There won't be freedom because we'll be locked into doing it because we have to and because we must and because it's required, not because of the relationship that we have. Um, as I said, it was not a fast that was prescribed. There were, however, fast observed by them that were not required by law. And we see this in Luke 8 and verse 12. Um, I fast twice in a week. I was, it was a custom observed by these Pharisees, um, but it wasn't an obligation. It was not correct to say, but thy disciples fast not. They fasted, no doubt, <laughs> but in a different spirit, in a different way. The critics were not interested in the subject of repentance. You know, they mentioned, you know, John the Baptist and, and how his followers fast. Well, they might have been following the pharisaic um, kind of laws to fast more than once in a week but John the Baptist spent a lot of time talking about repentance you hear them teaching about that no they would rather they would rather stick with the with the things that they that could be seen you can't see my heart whether I'm repentant or not but you can you can see me fast yeah and so for them it's what it's all about what you can see and that's that religious spirit looking at the fasting um, and, and when and how and for how long. But Jesus said to them, you know, what I'm talking about now, you can't, you can't just patch it. It's not like getting an old cloth and putting it on an, in a new, um, putting a new piece of cloth in an old dress. You can't do that. It's going to make the thing look terrible. You can't take new wine and put it in old skin because when it expands, it's going to burst. You, what I'm bringing to you is fresh and new. You can't mix it in with your old. Your old stuff needs to go. This religious attitude needs to go because what I've got, grace does not fit with the law. The law is there for our learning, yes, but grace fulfills it, meaning that we don't have to follow it to the T and to the letter because grace now abounds. Amen. I'm going to give you one minute if anybody has a quick comment before I do the last um section real quickly on the him addressing the Sabbath. You can go to the next slide, Jonathan, if no one um has any comments for that. Okay. Oh, the next one. I think I I think I popped ahead of myself. Okay. So we see that he is he's addressed he's addressed uh, forgiveness and healing. He's addressed um, the fasting, um, and again, we just came out of 21 days of fast. No one says you can't have a set time to fast. I'm not saying that, but your your fasting can't be ritualistic. Um, God doesn't receive that. He wants a, you to fast uh, from a place in your heart and uh, not just from an outward um, show. Finally, then we have the, the Sabbath. And in the Sabbath, again, um, the, the Pharisees lurking around, trying to... Um, to combat what Jesus was doing. 
And it happens that as they were walking through the fields, the disciples picked the grain and rubbed it together. And um, the, 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 the Pharisees jumped on it and says that they broke the Sabbath. Because on the Sabbath, you weren't allowed to work, right? You weren't allowed to do anything. And they looked at taking, plucking the, uh, plucking the, the, the corn was looked at as reaping. So they said, look, they're reaping corn and they're not supposed to because it's the Sabbath. So we know that if there's one thing that the Jews um, are known for, it's for keeping the Sabbath. And they're very strict. Their rules are very rigid and strict around it. So you're not supposed to work, for instance, on the Sabbath. So everything that you had to do had to be done the night before in preparation. So you wouldn't have to do any work that next day, whether it was be to cook, to have everything ready. So all you would do would be to eat. But the Pharisees were very good at making loopholes. So for instance, if it was um, to pick up a hanky and carry it from your bedroom to the kitchen would be considered work because you're carrying it. But if you put it in your pocket, you were wearing it. So it was okay. So they had their, their ways of getting round stuff, yeah? So they were very hypocritical in what they did because they would find ways in which to circumvent it, but still look like they were keeping the law. So um, again, here we see the disciples um, with Jesus and the Pharisees come to attack them for doing this. The two main ideas in Sabbath is rest and worship. The former, which is worship, held the first place in the old dispensation, dispensation than, the, than the latter. So before, rest was the, is the biggest um, part of Sabbath, resting because Jesus, because God rested on the seventh day, um, we should rest. We re they rested the earth. Every seven years, the earth was not allowed to be tilled or toiled. They had to just let, uh, you know, not dig or plant. Let the earth rest. Every seven, the seven uh, was important to them. And so they were very rigid about, about that. But, but Jesus came to say that the rest is um, worship is, is more of the emphasis in this dispensation um, and for in the gospel dispensation their position seems reversed for while never um, um, never to be separated worship comes more to the front holding a primary a primary part um, and rest then holds a secondary part so we're still we're still resting but we're resting in him we're, we're still observing um, taking time out to, to give to God, but, when, but, but it's more of worship, yeah, more than a physical stopping everything that you're doing to give time to God, but it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, a position of, of the heart, yeah, where God is concerned. So when the, when the disciples, um, uh, you know, plucked the corn and, and they were attacked or, or the Pharisees came and said, it's not lawful, yeah, look what you're doing, it's not lawful that you do this on the Sabbath day, Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Yeah, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. He reminded them of a time where David, and again, because of time, I really apologize that we don't have time to go through this like I really want to, but um, David um, and his men had been in battle. They, had, they were hungry. They'd been traveling. They got to the temple and they ate the bread. Now, if you remember um, that the bread that was in the temple, those 12 loaves that were in the temple um, were, on, were not to be eaten by anyone but the priests. But um, David went there and asked for help and they, um, he ate that bread. On any other circumstance, that would have been um, breaking the law, right? Because the law says you're not to do that. But in 1 Samuel 21, you can find this account. So go ahead and read it, refresh your memory. Um, that when David, um, he fled from Saul, he, he went and he was um, replenished and given this bread to eat. So Jesus, Jesus actually quoted this um, scripture to them and, and said, don't you, don't you know, you, you wonderful uh, Pharisees who know the law and know the Bible so well, because don't you know, don't you remember what it says in the Bible, how David entered the tabernacle and got holy bread and fed the hungry men? Yeah, though this was probably an incident of sabbath breaking jesus used this occasion to set aside ceremonial law for good and sufficient reason so he's saying to them look 
don't be so religious and so stuck on the law that you can't you you can't have common sense yeah would you rather the man starve and say no you can't eat this bread yeah um because it's um uh, uh, holy bread so jesus made this great um, announcement to them that i am the lord of the sabbath it's given to people as a privilege not a burden when when um, being a christian is burdensome you look out for the religious spirit yeah when 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 what you do is hard work it's because it's religious <laughs> it's because you're doing stuff religiously as opposed to doing it from your heart and that's the difference yeah it's not to be a burden the son of man is the lord of the sabbath yeah if i permit my disciples to pluck the corn then so be it because i'm the lord of the sabbath yeah whatever meets the lord's approval is right for the day and um, billy graham says we have come to worship things status fame money security anything that comes between god and ourselves is idolatry if these things mean more to you they're idols jesus demands lordship over all such things so everything that we hold dear above God is an idol and they need to come down. They need to come down because once that takes precedence, then Jesus is no longer Lord in your life. But that thing is, and that's important. He also talked, the, the next um, instance was the man with the withered hand, same idea. He heals the man and they're saying, you shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus again, say is trying to show them that what would you rather me let the man die than to, to heal him which is it is it is it more lawful then to kill on the sabbath than it is to heal so again using the sabbath as to say this is the law and you have to stick with it is not how how christians are supposed to be being fully aware of the pharisees and their motives jesus in effect asked his enemies what he should do he asked them what should i do then let the man die or heal him. You tell me. Now, what, what answer can you give? If you say let him die, you're allowing someone to die on the Sabbath. If you say heal, you're telling me I can, I can heal on the Sabbath. So again, we need to confront these religious attitudes um, with the word. Love will always triumph, triumph and trump legalism. Everything we do, if we do it in love, we won't be legalistic. But if you would just um, flip for me to to the last and final slide, slide 13, and, and, and I completely couldn't do it justice today, but I, I, I've, I've listed here um, some of the attributes of this religious spirit. Um, and if you recognize these things in yourself, you might read that and think, yeah, I, he's just like that. that mm -hmm, yes, you see, you could probably pick out people and give them these labels. But just think about yourself, yeah? Judge other people by the appearance, very common. They look at the outward rather than the inward all the time, yeah? They don't come from, they don't come from anywhere that's from where their heart is. It's always about what they look like on the outside. You try to earn God's love and salvation. It's an earned thing. They're always doing, wanting to do stuff, want to, want to um, you know, uh, do deeds. Yeah, the very, the very works led. Yeah. Now works isn't the problem. The work itself isn't the problem. It's what it does in your heart. It's how it makes you feel elevated because you've done that work is where the religious spirit comes in. You try to conform to outward holiness rather than without in, inward transformation. So everything you do is an outward show, but there's no inward change. So these people, they'll pay the tithe. They'll be at every single service. They'll be at every prayer meeting. They'll do whatever you ask them to do. But then, but there's no change of heart ever. Their heart's always the same. Um, you, you'll see the same people at the altar. Not to say you shouldn't come to the altar every week, but they're the same, same people who constantly need um, to come because their inward man has never transformed. They're critical of others, um, critical of other people's walk with God. They're the first to trace down somebody else. It's like the Pharisees always had something to say about Jesus's ministry. Yeah, they're always critical of other people's um, work. They'll find something to say. It was okay, but 
yeah, that was good. However, they're always doing that. I'm not talking about constructive feedback. I'm talking about that critical way. Your closest Christian relationships are based only on ministry activities. If you were to take away ministry, you probably ain't got no friends. Um, you, per you perform Christian duties, but have no passion or hunger for God. So you do all these things, but your passion for God isn't there. It's just those things. So you have a whole, you could, if I looked at your diary, it was filled with stuff that you're doing, but your hunger for God is nowhere to be seen. You desire position and honor in the church more than honor from God. So if I was to say, um, Christine, I'm taking away all your, your responsibilities. Um, I'm not, you know, you're not doing anything of leadership in our church for the next year. Just, I wanted to, you know, for whatever my reasons are, you would have a lot of issue with that because you, your desire is for that position rather than it is to honor God. So whatever you do, it has to be through a position. Without that position, you, you're, you're lost. Yeah, so they're very position orientated. You know, they'll do whatever, they'll manipulate, they'll do whatever they can um, to get that position. Also, your identity is rooted in a lifestyle of being a Christian instead of Christ. And it, you might say to yourself, well, this, this seems so kind of close, but yes, being a Christian isn't mean, doesn't mean you are Christ-like, yeah? Your lifestyle of being a Christian, so you go to church and you, you know, you do all those churchy things, you read your Bible, and you um you watch you know you know singing on YouTube you do all these things because you're a Christian but you're not Christ-like you don't you won't if I called you and said I'm really struggling you wouldn't be able to lift me in prayer you wouldn't be able to help me out in my situation you wouldn't see you're not moved by the Spirit to say the Lord told me to give you a hundred pounds here you go that's not where you are because your lifestyle uh, is a Christian but you are not haven't got Christ in you to that degree you know about the truth of christ but not the way of christ so you know all these things you can quote the scriptures you can do all those things but you don't have have that in him in you to to, to walk in it the religious spirit it does anything it can to oppose the holy spirit it, it mimics so instead of having um revelation you'll see theology so somebody will come to you and talk to you that's got the religious spirit or being influenced by the, the theological, they can go there, but they don't have no revelation. Yeah. They've got education, but they don't have no character. You'll see psychology, not discernment. Now you, you might think, oh, you really get me, but it's not because they're discerning it. It's psychology. It's not discernment. It's very different. They're very program led, but instead of spirit led. So you have a program and it has to go just like this. And it has to finish at this time. And if it doesn't finish at this time, it's a problem rather than letting the spirit lead. They're very eloquent. Yeah. They can describe and, and uh, you know, exegesis and do all of that wonderful thing. But there's no um, supernatural power. There's no anointing in what they're saying. Um, again, they're, they're very good at reasoning, but there's no work of faith. So they can reason through things and talk through things but there's, there's not a work of faith. And finally, they're very legalistic and, and look at the law, but there's very little love. People that want to want to drive um, legal things and the law will very, very, very few will show love because it's all about do, 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 and not love. And, and that's the religious spirit in a nutshell. There's so much that I really wanted to, to share and go into today, but just, let, let us examine ourselves, I'll say in closing. Examine ourselves and see where we are. Does, does any of that apply to me? Am, am I legalistic in the things that I do and the way that I think um, and how I treat people? Um, what, are, what are my true motives when it comes to Christ and the church and the kingdom? What are my motives? Is it because I want to be elevated or is it because I want Christ to be elevated? Let's not be like the Pharisees. The Bible says that the Pharisees, he said, he said watch out for because they, that leaven, you only need a little bit of leaven to mess up the whole lump. And if you have a church that shows a little bit of hypocrisy or a little bit of, of, of you know, that Pharisaic religious attitude, it will spoil the whole lump because the, the, it, will, it will spread throughout. So let's examine ourselves 
and to do what we have to do for ourselves in order for the kingdom to be established in the earth. God bless you. I'm probably going for going over. <laughs>